you can do stuff. Also let me know and I will add, add you to our beta tester list. That's it, thank you very much. Thanks for your attention. Questions? Are you around for the first break or are you leaving? Yeah, yeah, I'm around for the first, I'm, I'm gonna leave around 10, 30, 11 ish. Okay, well, asking a question now, but if not, he'll be around for at least the first break. So um, probably ask more questions then. Thanks. Um, so are you up right now? Okay. So Naomi will be giving the, uh, the talk for the morning session. Uh, and quick introduction for her. Naomi Nickerson is the VP of Quantum Architecture at SciQuantum, which is in the Bay Area and working towards silicon photonic quantum computing. Naomi's research is focused on designing architectures for fault tolerant quantum computing. She received her PhD from Perry of College, where she worked on quantum error correction, has since worked on topological, topological quantum error correction, ultra fast decoding algorithms quantum architectures and network photonic technologies. Uh, so I'll let you take it away when you're ready. Thanks very much. Is this audio okay? Great. Do people on Zoom ever? Sounds like they yeah. yeah. Um, great. Well, yeah, thanks very much for the introduction and for having me here in New Mexico. I've certainly been enjoying the weather and the warm evenings, which is a nice change from the Bay Area. So. Uh, yeah, as you've heard, I, I am based at SciQuantum, uh, where we're working to build a silicon photonic quantum computer. And I think the thing to say right at the beginning is that we're totally focused on fault tolerance and, and large scale quantum computing. And I think there's been quite a lot of discussion about that already during this week, I think, which has maybe set this up kind of nicely about what are the, what are the ways in which algorithms and the approach that you're taking at the end of the day on hardware, whether it's fault tolerant or whether it's directly on, on a NIST hardware, how that how those things interplay. So yeah, for this talk, we're, we're totally focused on fault tolerance. And what I wanna try and do is look at the way in which those things connect together. So, so I'm really a, a person who spends time thinking about architecture. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of ways in which those things connect and, and hopefully this can give a bit of a flavor of some of that. So the starting point of all of this, and I guess to set, you know, our motivation, my motivation for, for focusing on this regime is that if you look at algorithms which have a, uh, which are kind of can provably give you some result, uh, the number of gates that you need to get there, if you look at if you count T gates is, is really enormous. You know, it's, it's many, many billions. And the good news is that by you know, the work of people in this room and a bunch of other people, as you go over time, those costs are coming down and they're coming down very dramatically. So that's great, but like, it's still the case that, that these, these algorithms you know, running quantum chemistry and, and RSA are things that require billions of gates. And so no matter what hardware approach you're using, even if you're going down the route of getting, say, topological qubits, which have a massively suppressed error just natively, they're still not going to get you to this regime where you can execute billions of gates without also doing some sort of active error correction. And so that leads us to this regime where we need to think about fault tolerance and how we can implement gates in a way where we really have that, that, that route to suppressing errors to, to you know, these very, very small numbers. And what that raises the question of, especially you know, for this audience, is, well, how much does it actually cost to take one of these algorithms that we understand, where we can write down some sort of abstract circuit for it and some high-level programming language, maybe you know, the kind of language that, that Martin was just talking about, how do we take that and work out how much it's actually going to cost us to run on hardware? So what, how big of a machine is it going to be, and how long is it going to take to run? So you know, this question is, is stepping through, you know, we have an algorithm, we want to put it in full tolerant gates, and ultimately we want to get it onto hardware. And this is a very, very complex trajectory of things, and it requires a lot of an awful lot of layers and a lot of decisions along the way. And you know, this is the question that, that we spend a lot of time thinking about trying to answer this question. And I, I think it's one which there's, there's a whole lot more still to, 
still to understand. So the place to start to try and understand that question is to look at what is the, the stack of a quantum computer? What are all these different layers of abstraction that we have to move through to actually be able to map from some high level language through to like actual instructions that are, you're going to execute on a, on a piece of hardware? So we can start off looking at the NISC setting. So today there is a whole bunch of hardware that exists that is operating in something like like this kind of a mode. So you have some high level programming languages where you specify code at the top. You can turn that into a quantum circuit, which is something sort of more native to what you can execute. Probably need to map that to something which is actually native physical operations. So generally things don't directly implement C not gates, that will be implementing something that's you know, close to the hardware. And then eventually you can run that. So we have this, this, this stack, which goes through these different layers of abstraction. Um, but then we want what we're interested in here is, is looking at that fault tolerance setting. And what happens when you look at a fault tolerance stack is you end up inserting a whole bunch more layers into, into that trajectory that you have to go through. So we have to not only you know, map to a quantum circuit, but we now have to encode the quantum information. We have to restrict ourselves to a certain set of fault tolerant gates. We need to think about the physical logical architecture as well as the physical microscopic architecture. And, uh, you know, so, so we've added a whole bunch more into this. And this is the thing that I want to try and give a flavor of what happens here and, and, and you know, how, how it's going to affect that story. So this chunk in the middle, this is what I spend my time thinking about, is the quantum architecture. And, you know, this is really a, a design question, right? People have done this, this kind of job of designing computer architectures for, for many decades now for conventional machines. And you know it's an enormous field, and there's 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 many things that go into that. And our starting point for this is is science, right? So my background is a physicist. We need to like understand the physics of topological error correction or the physics of the system. But ultimately, you're taking those things and making a whole bunch of design choices. So, okay, I I'm very sure you've all seen a picture that's very much like that stack before. There's there's many of them floating around that will look very similar. Everyone's kind of thinking about these same things, but focusing on fault tolerance. So you might ask, like, isn't this kind of a done deal? Like, you can write down the picture, like we, we get it, we know we have to go through these steps. There's no, no sort of fundamental physics question left to be able to do that. And that, that's true, but we are very far today from having a technology which can actually implement this. And in fact, even in a even in, in simulation and in an abstract sense, there are big things that are really still missing from this whole picture. So this is just a few of them. Uh, and this is the kind of say actually a year ago when I started out um, with a bunch of people in the team of Psyquantum trying to look at a few of those things that'll be the focus of, of kind of what I'll talk about today. So yeah, here are some of the problems. So with fault tolerance, there really isn't a platform independent language for describing the way you can implement fault tolerant logic. Generally speaking, we understand it and people can write down operations, but in a way which is just really tied to the specifics of the system that you're working with. And that makes it very, very difficult to map between different systems. You don't have this abstraction. Uh, for photonics in particular, which is what I was working on, what I'm working on, uh, we did not have um, complete encoding methods. So, we didn't have a complete specification of the way that you should implement logical gates. Then there's simulation. So it was actually the case until recently that there had been no simulation of logical fault tolerant logical gates apart from the identity. So this should probably like, be kind of worrying if you if you want to trust that this stuff is going to work. The only thing simulated is the most trivial possible logical gate and anything beyond that. We're just you know hoping that everything's still worked out. Then there's stuff in hardware, so the decoding algorithms that you need to run, this classical processing, really needs a, a good solution in hardware that's going to run really fast, and that, that still doesn't exist in, at the level it needs to. Um, really need to be able to kind of optimize these logical, logical gate sequences. And yeah, Andrew, Andrew Landau was, was bemoaning this the other day at lunch that with decoding, you really need to take this massive problem, dice it up into pieces, modularize it so that you can actually solve that in real time. So, you know, there's a huge number of problems. This is just a few of them. I'm sure many people here can list many more 
But you know, there is a lot of work needed to take this from, from being kind of a purely theoretical exercise to something which, which really works. So the, this paper, which is the, the kind of focus, the main focus of, of this talk, a uh, bunch, of, bunch, bunch of other contexts, was really focused on addressing these top three things. So looking at fault tolerance as a part of this stack, how that affects your architecture, and how you can describe it in a way which you can actually start to scale. So this is what I'm going to go on to spend a bunch more time talking about. Now, I know most people here are not people who spend their time thinking about fault tolerance and quantum architecture. So you may ask, well, that's great, but uh, like, do I really care about that stuff? Uh, and that's a worthwhile question to ask. And I obviously think the answer to that is yes, you should care very much. But let me just try and motivate that so maybe you can be thinking in that way as I, I go through the rest of the talk. So, and there's actually, I think, been already some discussion. So I feel like maybe this has been set up well by some of the conversations that have been going on so far. So for quantum algorithms, and compiling in particular, if you want to look at how can I compile an algorithm in a more efficient way, that is all based on cost functions. What gates are expensive and which ones are hard? And what's the relative cost of those things? And so if you're thinking about running an algorithm in a fault tolerant regime, you better have good cost functions. And that's based on you know, really looking at what, what the structure of those operations is like. And for that matter, I would actually say that good cost functions actually don't exist. So even if you try today to go and like look at the look at the best methods that are out there, I think they're not great. And there's a whole bunch of stuff which is really not captured well. And I think to solve that problem, it just the only way is that people who really understand algorithms and compiling spend a lot of time working very closely with people who really understand fault tolerance, building up a better language than, than what we have today so that we can continue to advance that. Then this third point, I think this is really, really critical to kind of understand that, um, you know, we're maybe used to, and certainly this was my, my thinking coming into the field several years ago, that in conventional computing, it's great, you know, you have all these really hard interfaces, and if you're writing something in a programming language at the top, you just don't need to bother with what's happening with the hardware underneath. You just assume that the thing is going to work and do what you expect. And that's great, and it's a really nice world to live in, and it's one which we should aspire to in the distant future of quantum computing. But the fact is that every time you introduce a hard interface, you're throwing something away. So the cost of doing that is efficiency. And that's something we just we can't afford to do in early generations of quantum computing. I think people working in, in NISC really understand this very well, and it's all about understanding exactly what you have and the structure of the noise, the, the way that the operations work. And the same thing is, is true for fault tolerance. So, of course, in theory, yes, you can get your ideal qubits, but you pay a big price for doing that. And so we can really accelerate the rate at which we can make those machines useful if we have, a, have you know, more loose interfaces between things. And then finally, and this is hopefully something I can give a flavor of during the rest of the talk, is that the way fault tolerant operations work is really fundamentally different to the way NISC operations are working. In the, you know, to the level of you're not doing unitary operations at all, you're just doing projective measurements. So even like the physics of what's going on is very different. And I think that that is something which you can make use of to some degree. And there's a few ways that you can look at doing that, but probably there's a lot more to be understood about really how that changes things if you're thinking about using those gates to, to implement an algorithm. So yeah, I, I'm like, I'm very, enthusiastic about this topic because I, I kind of feel it's a place where there's a lot to be gained because the overlap so far has been relatively small in really merging these two fields together. Okay, so this talk is in two parts. Um, in the first part, I want to, I, I think, to you know, address this question, you really just have to take a close look at what is actually happening through the process of compiling from an algorithm through to the point where you're, you're setting, setting voltages on an actual piece of hardware. And so I wanna take a kind of baseline, you know, the most standard architecture you might think of for implementing fault tolerant logic. And I'm gonna think about photonic one in particular, because this, this is what we work on at Quantum, and talk you through all the layers that are happening there. What's happening is you're mapping to fault tolerant logic and 
and these topological gates and then and then through the layers of the stack and look at the things that come out at each of those pieces what is that telling you about maybe what you can can think about at a higher level and yeah so this overall picture is showing i think the very very broad scope of the problems that we have to tackle to build a quantum computer quantum computing technology is this you know enormously broad field where you're spanning everything from you know really hardcore engineering problems to totally exotic new physics style research and you know on the y axis here the other piece is, is you know the stack from from algorithms where we're looking at this very high level problems all the way to you know the microscopic physics of, of hardware and you know, maybe this is this is just the way of a new technology development it's you know extremely broad and this piece that I want to talk about first, you know, how do you specify and think about quantum architecture? It's definitely towards the more engineering side, right? We're trying to formalize something to make it specific. But in the second part of the talk, I want to take that and then say, well, how can we take the starting point and then use it as an inspiration to then go and look for the next generation of things? And I think often it's, it's actually very hard to even know what questions to ask at this far side before you've gone into some of the details, you know, before you've like really gone through some of the grimy details and understood what it is that, that is easy and hard and then you can take that back. Okay, so this is the, this is what I wanna go through. There's a lot of pieces here. I wanna tell the story of how you start with a quantum algorithm and go through all of these different layers. And what it comes down to is sort of making a whole bunch of decisions along the way about choices about what your architecture is gonna look like. What are you going to choose for all of these different pieces? What does that mean for the implications and, and how do we go through? So um, this is going to be based on, you know, the topic's very broad and so it's based on a bunch of stuff and I just want to highlight there's three papers here which I'm pulling different pieces from and assembling together into kind of this whole picture. So at the top end of the stack I'm going to be looking at the architecture at the kind of high high level logical architecture, which Daniel Latinsky, uh, wow, who I've mislabeled as Sam Roberts for that, and the top picture is uh, Daniel Latinsky, um, who ha has this paper from from a few years back. Then in the middle, this is the the recent paper, and I'm going to spend a bunch of the time on this, looking at quantum um, fault tolerant logic and how we can build a language for that and understand it and turn it into an instruction set. And this is particularly Sam Roberts and, and Ryan Mishmash, who are in the team at, at Psyquantum, who did that work. And then when we get to the lower level, I'm going to take some stuff from this paper on modular architectures for photonic quantum computing, at which Fernando Pistowski and Chris Dawson and, and Hector Bombin were particularly involved in. Um, okay, so to start with, just imagine your favorite quantum algorithm. Like hopefully everyone here has has a bunch in mind, you know, you can specify it at some high level, uh, you know, some high level operations. And this is going to be our starting point. And our goal is to try and push this all the way down and see what is happening at every layer. So the first piece is that we know we want to do fault tolerance, and that's going to mean uh, kind of stabilizer based error correcting code, which is the, the only tool we really have at the moment for that. And that's going to introduce a bunch of constraints into the, the gate sets that we can use. And so I think everyone's probably pretty familiar with this, that if you're working in a fault tolerance setting, the gates you have access to are Clifford gates, and those things are, are pretty easy. You can do those pretty cheaply. And then anything else becomes pretty hard. And small angle rotations are a nightmare because you have to decompose them into many, many gates. And the usual way that people think about doing this is that you allow yourself the ability to create one non clifford gate which is the t gate and you can make that by magic state distillation and then for everything which is non clifford you you chop it up into lots of pieces and implement it as many different t gates in sequence so there are actually many different options of, of ways that you can look at this gate set so you could say i just have you know clifford clifford gates so i have hadamards and, and c not gates and so on with a t gate but and, and there are different choices you can make but the, the architecture that I'm going to choose now is this one that Daniel Latinsky introduced called the Pauli product measurement architecture. So yeah, it's introduced in the paper. And, and the basic idea is that we're going to take our gates and compile them into a sequence of operations. 
of Pauli product measurements that are that are made with with some um, pi over eight rotation. Okay, so let me just introduce what that means. When I say a Pauli product rotation, I'm talking about this this picture on the left here. So um, it's a multi potentially multi qubit Pauli operator. Uh, which is applied with some rotation of some angle phi onto my qubit. So this is what we call a Pauli product rotation. And yeah, you can see an example of that on four qubits on the, on the right-hand side, where I, I'm taking this operator and I'm doing a rotation around an angle pi over eight. So this is like, this is a non-Clifford operation, but it's a multi-qubit operation. And so we're going to take this circuit and we can compile it. And I won't go through the, the details of how that compilation process works, but you can kind of see it all in this paper. We can take any circuit that we specify in a picture that looks like the picture on the left and just directly map it into a diagram or a circuit that looks like the picture on, on the right, where rather than expressing a whole bunch of individual qubit gates, we're looking at a sequence of gates, each of which can cover any number of, of qubits in, in the register here. So yeah, here I've, I've got a sequence and the number of, of these operations, each one which is a pi over eight rotation is equivalent to our T count. And we're gonna see that we need that number of, of T gates to implement it. So in practice, how can you actually implement this kind of operation? We know that the way we can do these T rotations is by having these magic states. And so you can decompose that operation uh, these, these green boxes, which are showing these, these rotation operations, into a, uh, as is shown in this diagram on the bottom, a projective measurement on the four qubits with a magic state. So I can't directly go and do that rotation. It's not part of my, the operations I can do in full tolerance. So instead I prepare a magic state, and then I just go and do a projective measurement on the four qubits that I was targeting along with the magic state. And so this is what we call the Pauli product measurement. PPMs. This white box is just a, um, something that we can deal with in classical processing, so there's some Pauli correction. And then after that measurement is made and we've, uh, and we've decoded it, there's some corrective measurement that has to be made to measure out that, that magic state at the end. So this requires feed forward. Okay, so this is the first piece. We've chosen to do these, uh, chosen to do these this Pauli product measurement architecture. And it's a bit different. Like you see already, this is not something you'd ever think about doing in a in this architecture because all I'm doing is these massive multi qubit operations. But it'll turn out in our fault tolerance setting, that's actually quite a natural way of thinking about things. Uh, and I think, you know, the takeaways from this level, so these ones are not surprising, right? Small angle rotations are a nightmare in a fault tolerant computing. You have to decompose them, they're super expensive. You want to avoid them. And um, the other thing is that, you know, if I look at this circuit, every single operation here is a pi over eight rotation. I don't actually, I'm not actually doing any Cliffords, right? There's nothing in separating these things in between. And that's because in, in practice, all of those Cliffords or Pauli's can just get absorbed in to these operations. And so everything actually is just condensed down to these, these kind of pieces that are at the core of what I need to do. Okay, so this was the first step. Uh, and the second step is that we need to move on to thinking about uh, physical space and connectivity. So we have uh, a bunch of logical qubits and we want to do these gates, but these things are actually going to be, you know, wired together somehow. Not every qubit is going to be able to connect to every other qubit. And so we need to make a choice at the logical level still of how our logical qubits are arranged and connected to each other. And so the choice I'm going to make here, again, this is, is coming from, from the same paper of Daniel's, is, and this is sort of the simplest thing you can imagine if you're working in, with these Pauli product measurements, is that we have this linear register. So we have one register of data qubits. So that's where you know, you're actually going to store the, the quantum state that you're manipulating. And then we have an ancilla register of the same size. And then we have a distillation block, which is the, the piece that's going to make our... Um, uh, which is going to be making our magic states. Okay, so we can just take a look at how that works. So up at the top, we've got this register, and then at the bottom, you're looking at this circuit, which is what we started out with our Pauli product measurements, which is what we want to implement. And so what this ancilla register allows us to do, and in this encoded setting, 
is that if we want to measure this some multi-qubit Pauli product measurement on several qubits of this register, I can just prepare an ancilla that is spread across multiple qubits. You can think of it as kind of a, a big GHZ state on that ancilla. And then I can connect it into the qubits that I'm targeting measuring. And then I measure out the ancilla and I, I extract the answer. So again, I hear the second one, I'm connecting to a different set of qubits. It's totally fine if I want to skip over a qubit. Like there's no reason intrinsically, as long as I have the right connectivity um, with my ancilla. And the, this is really just looking at a 2D layout. Um, again, I can you know, measure some two qubit operator. And then, of course, the thing that I'm actually wanting to do is measure these things with a magic state. And so for this, my distillation block is going to produce a copy of this magic state. Uh, we do a bunch of distillation inside here. Uh, of course, like inside here is just more qubits and more gates that are happening. But you know, we can just look at that as a, as a single unit. And then we make this projective measurement with the ancilla, but including the magic state. And in doing so, we're effectively implementing this pi of A rotation. And yeah, so again, there's produce another magic state in the next round and do the same thing again. So this kind of architecture, you know, it, it's very simple, but with an overhead of only two on the number of data qubits that you have in your register, you're giving yourself the ability to do, you know, any combination of measurements. One thing I should just say is like this picture is clearly like using the surface code and that is what I'm going to assume, but actually this does not need to assume the surface code. What I'm saying, like as long as you have the same connectivity between the logical qubits, and you could prepare this big GHD on your ancilla in an encoded way, you can do the same thing. So I'm, although the pictures have sort of assumed surface code, like the assumption itself does not need to have, have already chosen what the code is. Okay. So this was our, our physical architecture and we've made this choice. Like if you think about the instructions that we're now having, if we were writing this thing down in code, we have PPMs. These, these Pauli product measurements, but they now have a specifically assigned to locations that belong to some physical register. So we know we have a certain number of addresses and we have a time sequence and, and we've introduced some, some of these constraints. So I think the takeaways from this for you know, thinking about algorithms is these big entangling operations are, you know, they're, they're actually very cheap to do. And um, it's really, it, it, depending on the architecture, and certainly in this architecture, the cost of doing a two qubit uh, rotation with pi over eight would actually be almost exactly the same as doing one with the entire register. Now, there's a whole bunch of things that you can think about, you know, changing this up where you have, you know, the ability to do more things in parallel and you have different regions and more magic state factories. And it, really the only reasonable way of thinking about those is in conjunction with thinking about the algorithms. Like what rate do I want to produce magic states and consume them? And how do I balance those things out? Okay, so great. So we've looked at these high level pieces. We've looked at um, you know, the instruction set for the gates, how the things actually get arranged in space. And so now we want to go on to this piece of how we actually look at doing that in a full tolerant way. We need to actually choose a way of encoding our qubits and a way of encoding our gates, which, of which there are kind of multiple ways for the same code. And then we want to turn those gates into an actual instruction set so we can start to formalize that and turn it into a, a language. And so I'm going to make a, a few choices here. And like this is the baseline architecture. So I'm, I'm choosing the, the simplest option. So we're going to choose. Uh, to do these patch-based surface code qubits and do our logical gates using lattice surgery type approaches. And yeah, just commenting that those things are still completely platform independent. So at this level, we're not talking, we're not saying anything about the hardware that's sitting underneath this. We just want to talk about these logical gates in kind of a, a purely platform independent way. So if we're going to think about a, a logical qubit and a surface code in a way which yeah, is independent of the, of the platform. The way we can do that is just by thinking about its topological properties. So we're talking about topological error correction. So if many of you have probably seen these pictures like this of a surface code where we have some uh, bulk, some patch in the middle, which is made up of our quantum system. And then the things that actually make it into an error correcting code are the existence of a certain set of boundary conditions. 
So in these codes, the logical information, so our logical qubits are stored in these topologically non-trivial uh, cycles. And so it's really the boundary conditions that, that matter. And so we can look at one of these qubits just as this like, little square where we've got boundaries that are of one color on one side, uh, primal boundaries, or they sometimes get called rough, rough and smooth boundaries. And then yeah, another color of boundary on the top. And actually the most important feature is the point at which these boundaries meet, which makes corners. And these things, which are the meeting point of boundaries, this is really what's encoding the information. And these things actually are, are like Majorana fermions. And as you'll see what's happening in computation is we're manipulating those corners in order to, to do computation. Okay, so now we wanna look at logic. How do we think about logic, given that we've make and made this particular choice about the gates? And so if you're thinking about some kind of static array of qubits, you might want to think about your gates in, in this kind of way. So this is kind of a common way of, of looking at these operations where I have, I have some arrays. This is kind of like my, my register of qubits. And I want to make some measurements. So, you know, maybe in the first time step, I do something like this. Maybe in you know, the next time step, I want to do some you know, operation on one of those qubits. Maybe in the next time step, I do something else. And, you know, the thing continues. And so you can express your logical gates as some time ordered sequence of instructions that you're implementing on, on your system. But an alternative way of looking at this thing is that I actually just trace out the entire world line of what is happening with the system. So rather than you know, thinking about a sequence of directions, I kind of look at the whole trajectory and I use that to build a space-time diagram of the operations that are happening over the lifetime of those qubits. So this is a very helpful way of thinking and is actually the way in which we can reach something which is more platform independent. So this way of looking at st a static array is completely useless for photons. Like we can't take our photons and glue them onto a, glue them onto a chip and have them waiting around there. They're constantly flying around, but it is the case that we can still use them to create a space-time diagram that looks exactly the same as this. And so we wanna think about this picture as a way of kind of looking at the thing holistically. And when you look in this picture, you also really see the topological structure of what is happening during these logical gates start to emerge. So we think back to this kind of flat surface, what we see is that those corner lines that were there, uh, corner points get traced out into world lines that are continuing through this computation. And the, the, the primal boundaries that get traced out into these surfaces. And likewise with the dual faces, and you see things happening like, oh, well, I now realize that the, those dual faces can actually some sit flat in the time direction. They don't always have to sit, uh, you know, as if they were flat that when you projected onto the plane. And I also see that these corner lines, actually, sometimes they travel in the space direction. They don't always have to travel in the time direction. So you see the structure here emerge. And what actually matters in this computation, the thing, the thing that's actually making it work is that I'm taking these corners and I'm fusing them and I'm splitting them and I'm braiding them around in certain ways, which is, which is implementing these gates. So this is a very nice way of, of thinking about what's going on. Um, and you know, this, this, is, this is not new, right? This is the way people have understood these things. And, but I think the link of that to how I actually build instructions has, has not been like a very common way of thinking about things. So here's an example that I think is quite nice of why this is a good way of thinking about what's going on. So when we think about projecting things onto a 2D plane, you can understand what's going on with the logical qubits, um, but you end up really restricting yourself to a view in which your logical qubit time always flows in the same direction as, as like physical time. If you look at this whole picture, so this is two examples um, of, a, of a control not gate. And so in this picture on the left, you see two pictures where I've got like my two logical qubits that are, are on a plane. I introduce an ancilla and I sort of couple the qubits to the ancilla in two different ways. And over several time steps, I implement a C not gate. The picture on the right is also showing a C not gate. But in this picture, the logical time directions of the two logical qubits are flowing in a perpendicular direction. And you can kind of see from this is significantly more compact way of implementing this gate. This is a much more natural way of looking at C naught. Um, here you've got, I mean, you've got tons of extra overhead, you've got this ancilla, you've got a lot of extra space. 
And I mean, this is just an illustration, right? But the logical operation that's happening here can be much more efficient and take much less volume and space if we kind of free ourselves from this picture of constraining everything to be projectable into a 2D plane. The actual implementation could still be completely 2D. All I'm talking about here is the picture in which we're looking about these things and understanding these things. And we were actually having this discussion at lunch the other day about yeah, log logical time does not need to coincide with physical time. And actually that can be a powerful tool when we're looking at these kinds of things. The constraint that matters at the algorithmic level is actual causality. Like when is that feed forward? That fixes physical time. But just the interactions of the qubits does not need to. Okay, so this was a little bit of an aside. And now uh, I want to go back to this question that we we're looking at, which is how can we take this beyond logic and actually turn it into something tractable? Like we want to turn it into instructions that we can write down and formalize in a way so we can actually look at building this stack. Okay, so we have we have this picture, and, and what we're interested in doing is taking it and dicing it up into pieces, like a finite set of pieces uh, that we can describe very explicitly in such a way that we can start to build up any circuit um, with, a, with a finite set of pieces. So it, it's very much like plumbing pieces, right? Like I think there's some nice piece of, uh, of artwork based on, based on plumbing, but it's the same idea. You've got to have a finite set of pieces that you can you know, actually design and, and be specific about, but in such a way that you can construct any, any universal circuit. So, I want to just go through a few examples um, that, are, that are kind of written here in, in this formalism. And the idea really is to take this abstract picture, which like had all the main properties, it has this, these topological features that are arranged in a certain way, and make it into something which is very explicit, like is an explicit description of, of what one of these logical blocks can look like. And so really what, what is always happening in these logical systems is that I have a bulk. So in like most of the thing is just some bulk. And then in order to make this do something meaningful, I introduce topological features that break the bulk in some way. So there's actually not very many ways in which that can happen. So there are these primal boundaries and dual boundaries that are truncating the surface in a different way. Now, maybe just a comment, sorry, I'm gonna come onto this later, but this starts to get kind of quite abstract, right? We're looking at this, topological system, like fundamentally, this is a quantum system that we're making measurements on, right? And I'm making measurements in order to, to make this thing. So you can, you can also think about it in that way. So, okay, here's the simplest one we can imagine. We have an identity gate. And in order to define it, I just, I'm gonna say I have a cubic cell complex. And I, on that cell complex, I can label the faces in one of three ways. They can be labeled blank, in which case it's something inside the bulk or they can be labeled as a primal boundary, which are these blue ones, or they can be labeled as a dual boundary, in which they're these red ones. Um, and so in doing so, I can, I've, I've specified the structure of that, that well. Oh, the one other thing actually I should say about the faces, they can also be labeled as a port, in which case they're on the outside of this structure. And it's a place in which I'm expecting this thing to get connected into the next piece. So they're the connection points and you can like, see those in the picture at the end. Okay, so we looked through a few more of these. So if I wanna do an, a logical X or a logical Z measurement, all I'm doing there is I'm sort of capping off the block. So I'm connecting, I'm just sort of connecting it over with either a, a primal surface or a dual surface, depending on which one I want to do. You can see what's happening there is that causes these corner lines to get fused together. And that's what's making you do the measurement. Uh, I need these connection pieces that are going to do entangling operations. So these ones have many more input ports. This one's doing a lattice surgery operation. So it's doing these projective, um, like a, a Pauli projective measurement on, on multiple qubits. This one's doing a, yeah, a multi-qubit X measurement, basically a GHC type measurement on multiple qubits. And so here I have sort of the three logical qubits coming in and then this big patch, which is connecting them together. And again, like what that patch is enabling you to do is just connect up the corner lines in the correct way. So I'm connecting them up sort of pairwise in such a way that I, I end up doing that projection. Okay, now we come on to one. I said there was there is another kind of defect, that, um, another kind of topological feature that you can have. 
which doesn't sit on the boundary, but instead runs through the bulk. And that's called a domain wall. And so if I want to implement phase gate, I need to introduce that kind of a, that kind of a, a topological feature. So in this one, I have one logical qubit coming in. I have boundaries on the outside. And I also have this, this defect that runs through the bulk. So what that, what that defect is doing is it's essentially changing the flavor of an error that flows through it. So as I go through that domain wall, if, if an error chain goes through the domain wall, it's going to swap from being one type to the other type. Uh, and yeah, in, in, doing, in doing that operation, you manage to create this logical operation that, that is implementing the phase gate. Okay, that's so Hadamard gate. Um, maybe we won't go through that. So yeah, the, the end of the day, there's the, the story here is that we can, yeah, we can write down, we have an explicit language. It's a cell complex with labeled faces. So I can really write that down in code to specify this complete set of operations. And you know, this is obviously something we need if we want to complete our process of mapping algorithm down all the way through to, to hardware. But it's actually also a really necessary tool for a bunch of the things you want to do in design. So I talked about simulation, right? So you can now take these blocks, plug it into a decoding tool and simulate all of these logical blocks or plug them together and simulate a larger circuit. And so the good news is we have now validated that the threshold is the same for all of these different blocks, including all of these features. So this was expected, but not known. When you introduce all these topological features, they, they do have the potential to change the thresholds. Like you have thresholds that, that are, are modified when you introduce these surfaces. Um, you can also do some kind of nice things like you automatically can check the behavior of the logical operators and that they're doing the things you want. You, yeah, you can map between decoding tools. So like you can easily then map between things which maybe were applied to different platforms. You can just plug them in. Um, and yeah, I think also if you, if you think about the problem of designing logical gates, if, you, if you're looking at specific methods that are you know, designed for specific systems, it's like very complicated to think about how those transfer. But if you look in this picture and you translate your gates into this language, then you could just immediately like look at a logical block and then map it into instruction sets for different hardware platforms. Okay, so th this is the end of, uh, of this section. We've got to the point where we have our logical instruction set. You know, we chose these particular patch-based qubits and doing lattice surgery. And then we looked at how we can you know, chop those up into a, a specific set of instructions. So if you think about having, you know, our language now at the point we've compiled to, we've got you know, a finite set of these logical blocks and we've got a list of them. And then for each of those things, we've got a specific, you know, instruction set stored that said, when you want to implement this logical block, here is a cell complex that tells you exactly what features you're going to need to implement at these different space-time locations. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, if I was to pick a main takeaway from this part, it's this thing about space and time and particularly in these fault tolerant systems that they don't have to be constrained to be the same. And in some cases, we've been doing things maybe in a more efficient way than we need to because of thinking in that picture. But I think there's probably a lot more room to think about those things in a more combined way between algorithms and the fault tolerant logic itself. Like how, how can that allow us to optimize more by looking between the two different levels? Okay, so, We've got down to logical instructions, but so far I haven't talked anything to do with the actual hardware. And so now we need to go one level deeper and look at how we are actually going to implement these logical gates. What quantum system are we using? What are the measurements going to be? And so there are, there are two choices that I want to look at here. So one is that you have to make a choice about what your computational model is. Are you doing circuit-based? Are you doing you know, measurement-based? Are you doing fusion-based? Um, and then you have to specify the actual microscopic details of the code, like where are the qubits going to be and how are they going to be connected together. So that's the job. We want to take this system and map it into some yeah, specifics of a, of a quantum system. And this is where like, it comes to the thing that I mentioned at the beginning about measurement being really at the heart of everything in, in fault tolerance and fault tolerant operations. And so First thing to say, like, regardless of the system that we choose, what it's fundamentally going to look like is we have a bunch of 
we have a quantum system of some kind, and then we make projective measurements onto those qubits. And we make repeated projective measurements, and every time we do that, we extract some classical information. And it's really that classical information that we're extracting, which ends up being correlated in the right way because we've designed it according to the structure of a logical block that is allowing us to you know, get the information we need for error correction and then get the information we need to reconstruct like the correlations in these logical blocks that then feed into the algorithm. And so the specific choice that I'm gonna make here, so this is you know, what side, this, the approach that Quantum is taking in our architecture is that we're gonna do fusion-based quantum computation, that's the computational model. And then for the specific details, I'm gonna choose a particular construction called a cubic fusion network. Um, and I'll show you now what, what that looks like. So what is fusion-based fusion quantum computing? So in this model, we are, we are the, the resources that we have available are constant size resource states. So we have some in small entangled resource states of a constant size, and we have the ability to do projective entangling measurements. So this is a very natural model of thinking about things in a photonic architecture where your projective measurements, so the measurements you make on photons are destructive. So this is you know, the motivation for thinking in this picture. And so you really think about building up this quantum system by taking many, many copies of these resource states and arranging them in space, space time, and then making these projective entangling me measurements on collections of those qubits from different states. And then this is showing a very explicit construction of, of one such network. So we call this a fusion network. It's telling you specifically how you should arrange those things in, in, in space time. So I'm gonna take one resource, six qubit resource state, and it's specified there as a little cluster state. It's actually, a, it's just a ring, six qubits on a ring, but in this orientation, they, they look crossed over. And I put one of those onto each vertex of a qubit lattice. And then for every bond of the qubit lattice, I do a fusion measurement that connects two qubits from the resource states at either side. And I, I'm doing a particular measurement in a particular basis, and these states have a very particular structure such that when I do that, I end up implementing error correction. So those, those measurement outcomes that I'm getting after I'm done, there's no states left. So after I'm done, everything has been measured out, but I'm left with a bunch of classical information which forms into parity checks and I can use for error correction. So that's really just the bulk. And of course, I said what, you know, what we need to implement logic is the ability to implement these topological features on top of the bulk. So I take the bulk and then in certain locations, I need to do some special operations that are gonna you know, modify the structure so that I end up with a different, different correlation structure which corresponds to these surfaces or, or to these defects that run through the bulk. And really what this comes down to in this fusion-based architecture is just that in certain locations, I modify the measurement. So rather than doing this XX ZZ measurement, maybe I do a single qubit measurement or maybe I connect together a qubits in a slightly different way. So this picture, which looks kind of, there's an awful lot going on in here and the, the specific details don't really matter too much. This is a phase gate. It's kind of oriented in a different way. And it's a cubic lattice. So you can just think of the, the cubic structure that's underlying that as that fusion network. So every vertex in that is a, um, every vertex is a resource state and every edge is a fusion. And so this is a labeled, construction where every one of those edges has a label that tells you what operation you're doing. So most of them just tell you just do a regular fusion. But in some special cases, so there's this place where they're blue and then there's the kind of plane running through, there'll be special labels on certain edges that are telling you on this edge, you're gonna do something slightly different. So I'm gonna make a single qubit measurement on these edges in order to create the boundaries, or I'm gonna make a different measurement and then maybe I'm gonna extract a YY outcome in certain places in order to make these defects. So yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot going on there. The details don't really matter. What matters is that I, you know, you can get to the point where I now have an explicit uh, graph, which just is an instruction set. And I, I can map from that in a sort of deterministic way, according to some set of rules where I start out with my logic block and I just map it onto this fusion network, which is the instruction set I actually need for this architecture. 
And yeah, it's just worth saying, like, to go back to this point that, you know, you can do this in different ways. If I was interested in a, a circuit-based architecture, or I have a, an array of matter-based qubits of some kind, then I can just take a different set of rules. I can take my same logic block, a different set of rules about how to construct this and convert the same block into an instruction sequence, which I could then execute on those matter-based qubits. And so, yeah, all this comes down to is like, I have some set of rules and I can use that to convert from my, my platform agnostic block in, to a specific hardware instruction set. Um, okay, so that's the end of this piece. You know, now we've mapped onto specific instructions. We've actually chosen details of the architecture and the computational model. And yeah, I think the takeaway from this, this level is what's actually going on in these operations is just all about measurement. It's like measurement, the logic is measurement, fault tolerance is measurement, the measurements are measurement, you know, the whole thing is just measuring and, and extracting classical information. And I think it's just the case, you know, if you think about algorithms and you say, I'm just assuming that the gates are good enough that I've got perfect gates, what is underneath that is an enormous amount of data about the quality of the gate and what happened in decoding and what happened where that's being thrown away. And maybe that's not such a good thing, right? Fundamentally, this is all mediated by classical data. And that is doing something where you've introduced a hard boundary, where you said, you know, beyond this level, I don't care about any of the data that happened below. Maybe there's a way of smoothing out that transition that is a better way of kind of making use of what is fundamentally happening at, at this level. Okay, so on to the final piece. We're nearly at the bottom. We're getting down there into the hardware. And, um, I, you know, I think, you know, at this level, there probably is some level where the distance from quantum algorithms is such that it's not so relevant, but it's kind of interesting just to look at the end of the story and how we really, really get down to just setting a voltage on a device. <coughs> so for that, we need to look at how this thing actually gets embedded into a, a device into physical hardware i still i'm still looking at sort of abstract specification of you know a graph with measurements and so the architecture that we we think about for doing this is that we have some array of modules these interleaving modules and inside each of those modules so these things are connected together in an optical network inside each of those modules is a resource state generator that's the box labeled rsg and you can think of this thing as a device which spits out these entangled states and these lines and then waveguides which are routing that state to certain locations. And so they get routed through a bunch of delays and then eventually end up in these boxes labeled F, which are the fusions. So this is a box which receives two qubits and is making this, this projective measurement. So that's the place where we're, we're making those measurements. We're doing the things that are connecting those states together. Now, inside each of those, those boxes, those things are reconfigurable. So they have to be reconfigurable so we can modify those things to implement logic. And what that looks like is I actually have my two qubits going in and then a switching network, which will route them to different locations, which is then you know, enabling me to change what the measurement basis on those qubits is. So I have several different options there. I can do the fusion, I can do single qubit measurements, or I can do a magic state measurement for injection. And okay, so we've got qubits in a switching network. What's happening inside a switching network in an optical system is that we have some kind of interferometers with uh, variable phase shifters on them. And so this is just a, you know has a single photon coming in that I can uh, I can look at as a qubit. I can route the photon into different locations in the output depending on how I choose that phase. So that that red box here, this is a phase shifter. What's happening in a phase shifter is that I have some you know, material that I've overlaid on top of a waveguide that when I apply voltage to it, changes the refractive index of the waveguide in such a way that it adds a phase to that photon. And so that I, by, by applying that in a sufficient way, and you know, I choose a pi or a zero phase shift, I can route the qubit to one of the output ports. <sighs> and so that's the bottom. We got all the way down. You, know, you start in an algorithm, you map it all the way down, like you end up with a voltage. And you know, okay, there's, there's an enormous number of things that go into that. Right? You're going from, you know, the, the length scales involved and the complexity and, and the size, it's this enormous funnel that's pushing you all the way to the bottom. And, you know, this is the business of designing an architecture. And there's no, there's no sort of magic to this. There's nothing optimal about any of this. There's no possible way that you could 
write down this whole problem in a formalized way and just choose an optimal solution. You're making design choices at every level. And kind of the whole business is about, you know, you zoom out and you try and look at everything that's going on. And then you see some bad stuff and you zoom back in and you optimize and you change something and, and you zoom back out. We're looking at, you know, the, this huge system. And yeah, this version that I've presented to you is, is really just a baseline architecture, right? We were gonna build an architecture today. It would not look like this because for pretty much every one of these pieces, there are smarter things you can do that look a bit more complicated. And, and you know, there's also thousands of options out there at every stage where like people just have not looked into even a fraction of the things that you could do because there are so many combinations of, of different things. And yeah, I think, you know, I certainly feel very optimistic that there's a lot further that this can get pushed. Now we have the whole picture, which is actually only a recent thing, I think, to really be able to see this whole picture together. And, you know, there's a bunch more below this as well about the physical system and, and things that are sort of beyond what, what is relevant here. So now I, I want to, you know, take that as a starting point. Like hopefully you have some kind of a picture. I know there's a ton of stuff in that and the, the, the job is not really to understand the details, but just to get a sense of like the scope and the scale and these, these implications that are happening at all the levels, and then you know, try and back that out to something useful. And so I wanna just you know, take that and, and give a favor of some of the things that that then can lead into. Uh, and you know, this is just a few examples of many, because that's really you know, a big part of the motivation of doing that. Why do you try and solve these like nitty gritty engineering problems when you know, you're, you're at this, this stage in the technology? It's so that you can go and iterate and really understand what's important. Uh, you can understand what the cost functions are and where you should be trying to improve. So then you can zoom back out to theory land and, you know, hope that you're, or know that you're looking at problems that matter. So, okay, here's one problem. This is a, a problem that a bunch of the people in, in our applications team looked at um, last year or a year, year or two ago, which is trying to understand um, a quantum chemistry problem that was relevant to to, uh, to Mercedes-Benz, and we worked with a few people from the team there. And so they had some specific uh, chemical reactions they're interested in that go into battery chemistry. So they wanted to understand you know, the behavior of certain electrolytes, and that involves chemical simulation, estimation of, of energies, such a way that you can do it on a, on a conventional computer. And the goal of that project was really to sort of understand the implications of, of pushing this thing all the way through this stack from top to bottom, so that in the end you can actually count how many resource states do you need. Yeah, and that really goes all the way to the bottom. It relies on everything all the way down to, you know, what is the arrangement of my chips and how much fiber delay do I have? All of those things have an impact on that answer. And so, at, you know, at the end of that project, you, you can end up with answers. So this plot on the left is giving something more of a high level answer. You can count, you know, how many logical qubits versus how many T gates do I need? So that's somewhere sitting more in the middle of that stack. And, but, you know, more specifically, we can then translate that to hardware requirements. I think it's fair to say, you know, this thing is still pretty big. You know, you're looking at a number of resource states that is, you know, a million and, you know, lots of time, but there's some trade-off you can make between those things by like, trading off between space and time. But you now can actually turn that into a, you know, a specific answer that, that tells you, you know, how far away you are from from being able to answer that. So that's the one example. That's more about how you can make use of that whole stack in order to understand algorithm design better and to you know, go through a process of optimizing with respect to you know, the actual number that matters at, at the end of the day with respect to an architecture. And the other example that I wanted to pull out is something which is more at the fault tolerance level. So it's looking at the way in which you encode quantum information and how you can make use of this way of, way of thinking about these kind of space-time pictures to maybe do something better. And so it, there's this idea that, that also came out of this work with, with um, you know, Sam, Sam Roberts and Ryan and, and Hector Bombin in looking at these logical blocks that this is an alternative way of encoding information. So you think this thing's a big patch of surface code and these green lines, those are defects that run through the surface. And where the crosses are, those are corners, but sort of corners that live inside the surface. So this is, this is not new, like it's known that you can encode 
logical qubits in these defects that live within the big patch of the surface code. But the challenge is how do you do logic on that? So it was not at all obvious how you could then use that to implement logical gates uh, in a way that you know, still sort of made sense. So here is the scheme that, that we came up with. So this is now looking at space-time diagrams. So I've taken this thing and extruded it up in space. So now the green sheets running through, those are the, the twist defects. And for every pair of those, you're in, encoding some logical qubit. And we can now imagine introducing a new kind of topological feature, which is a portal. So now we're going to say, well, I don't care about the thing being local in space-time, which I don't with photons. I, I can connect things together in different places. And this place where the arrow is on the left, I've got this plane, this kind of blue and purple plane. And the idea is I take two planes in different locations and I connect them together in such a way that if I like travel into that plane from one end, I hop out the other end. And likewise, if I travel in from the other end, I, I hop out on the other side. So you're sort of being you know, teleported across. I mean, you are an error chain is being teleported across as it, as it travels through. And so by introducing those portals, you can use that as a technique to make a logical measurement of a logical qubit encoded in those twist defects. You can kind of see what's, what's happening here. Like I, the, the twists go into the defect and they pop out the other side. And in doing so, I'm able to close a membrane that wraps around it. So that thing's kind of representing the logical operator. And so this is something which you, you, you know, you, for which you need to introduce this topological feature, which is very hard to think about if you're you know, projecting yourself onto a 2D plane. So I think, you know, this is the kind of thinking you can maybe enable by looking at this holistic picture. Now, what is the motivation to do this? It's that we really don't want to have boundaries in computation. Every time you have a boundary, you add an overhead because it makes the scaling behavior worse. Like you have worse entropy behavior. There's way more ways errors can happen when you introduce these boundaries. And so it's a nice thing if we can do boundaryless computation. And you know, this gives a way then of being able to do computation with no boundaries at all. So this is still speculative, you know, there's a, there's a lot to understand if that you know, really works out in the end. There's all sorts of trade-offs, do you win? I don't know, but it's certainly kind of showing that there's different stuff that you can look at, different ways of doing logic, even within the framework of the codes that we already understand. If you, you know, free yourself from being projected in, into 2D. Okay, so this is, you know, this is the end and hopefully there's a little bit of time for questions. I think there's, there's a lot of stuff in there. Hopefully it's just kind of, is really just to give a flavor of what is happening. Right? There's so many, so many layers, so many pieces. And each of those is, you know, I, I can zoom in even further and, you know, there's years worth of complexity that goes into every single one of those pieces. And this thing of looking at quantum architecture is like really about trying to see the big picture and the implications and what connects to what and what matters where and in which places those things are important. And I think hopefully I highlighted a few of those that I think are important for quantum algorithms. Um, and in general, I, you know, I feel very optimistic actually about the, the ways in which there might be things to exploit if only because I think it's, there's very few people and very little time that's really been spent at the interface relative to the time that's been spent within the different areas. And you know, if history tells us something, it's that when you get a better interface, there's normally things that are there to be exploited. So I think that's everything. I think, yeah, there's a lot of these questions that have to answer. You know, how can you exploit these features of the systems, this local connectivity, the classical information? And yeah, I would be very happy to have some more discussion with that and um, answer any questions on, on any of this if we have a bit more time. So thanks very much. Go ahead. Yeah, I have some very naive questions. So the first question is, um, how do I, uh, if I want to count the, uh, the number of uh, physical qubits by looking at the uh, the logical block, do you, uh, uh, is it pro proportional to the volume of the logical block or proportional to the horizontal, uh, the area of the horizontal process? Is there a way of getting everything up here so we can skip back through the slides, like the presenter view? Um, 
because otherwise they're going to have to blind everyone by flashing a million three. Okay. I'm just going to do it. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So look at this picture of a logical block. So yeah. So the, the first answer is, yeah, it corresponds to the slice, the number that are in the slice through. So your algorithm specifies some logical error rate that you need to hit, and that specifies some distance for this block. So the block like, has multiple variations. It could be small or big, depending on how much you need to suppress the error. Then you take a slice through, and that tells you the number of qubits. Um, but the, 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 the number of physical qubits that need to be coexisting at the same time. You use the convention the body direction is high. So yeah, you, well, you can choose, you choose a direction, right? So it, it doesn't, you, you could choose to make a system in which you do that whole thing in one shot. Uh, but the lowest footprint way of doing it is to make something which chooses a time slice. That's the fewest qubits you can possibly have. You can always parallelize by making, like by having more physical qubits. If I had you know, enough physical qubits to do the whole thing in one shot, I could do it in a single time step. So if you have that many physical qubits, um, I'm just wondering the amount of data, if you measure it, is it proportional, linearly proportional to the volume of the larger qubits or exponentially proportional to the, the number? Linearly of proportional. So you get out, well, and then, yeah, you get out two bits per edge in this structure. So the amount of classical information is, is just proportional to the volume of the, of the block. Uh, I was wondering, because if you just think about it, the dimensional qubits, uh, you can pro basically produce the exponential amount of qubits with uh, a linear number of qubits. Here, the classical information you can produce is linearly pro proportional to the volume. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions? Uh, we have a question from Eleanor online. Um, do you have a sense for what the wall clock time would be for logical gates in the basic photonic architecture? You should. Uh, so we usually think about a baseline clock rate of a gigahertz for generating single photons. Uh, so that's kind of the fundamental clock speed. That's it's actually, uh, like it can potentially be faster than that, but one gigahertz is a, is a kind of reasonable place to think. You're limited by um, things like the switching time and, and the detector times. Uh, but the way that translates to the clock speeds at different layers of the architecture, you kind of go through many places where you have uh, choices actually about how much you multiplex between space and time. So the thing about photonics, and I didn't really have, you know, I didn't have time to go into this, but what is happening in this, in this architecture is that you, you can see in this picture at the top, there's this L squared delay. So this is a delay line of, um, you know, if I look at the size of my code and I say it's a 10 by 10, I've got hundred time steps of delay in that fiber, uh, which allows you to use a single resource state generator to produce an entire patch of a surface code. So, if you think about the clock speed of a single photon generation of, of being one, one gigahertz, and that yeah, I don't do any time multiplexing in resource state generation, so my resource states produced at the same rate, then this L squared gives me like a slowdown to the rate at which I'm producing layers of the, of the surface code. Um, and that's a tunable factor. So yeah, if you think about depending on what, what delay you choose there, you can slow down or speed up your logical gates. Did that answer the question, Eleanor? I don't know if you can hear me. I'd still be curious for an estimate. I know this depends on things like L, as you mentioned, but I'd still be curious. Yeah, so we- um, Probably understand if you don't. Yeah, yeah. so we often think um, about a, uh, a fiber delay of one kilometer, which allows you to put in about 5,000 time bins. And so that's taking about 5,000 nanoseconds um, to, for your, while your qubit sits in fiber. And so in some sense, the slowest 
uh, logical layer rate that you can then create with a system like that is uh, 5,000 nanoseconds for a single layer of the surface code. And then you have some number of layers of the surface code to build up to a logical block, which you know maybe is 10 to between 10 and 50, depending on the code distance. So let's thank see. you. Yeah. All right, well, we have a break right now and you can ask Naomi uh, many more questions during the break and we'll reconvene here at 1030. Would you mind deleting the presentation? Yes, absolutely. Oh, Josh. Yeah. So, about your pot, you kind of have the cost from the two and then you have the that you were saying that you're considering the surface code here. What other kinds of code? 